For over 50 years, we only knew one face of the moon, the near side, the far side, silent, hidden, a mystery. Until now, China's Chang'e 6 mission has landed and brought back the first ever samples, proof of a secret history. Are the two sides of the moon truly different? Or have we been blind all along? For the first time, the far side speaks. China's far side moon samples finally speak. Early lab results point to a South Pole Aitken impact around 4.25 billion years ago. Here is what the grains from Chang'e 6 actually reveal. What can a handful of lunar soil tell us about the history of the entire moon? Early analyses now suggest the giant South Pole Aitken impact basin formed about 4.25 billion years ago, an anchor age that shifts crater, dating from estimate to measurement. Chang'e 6 just returned nearly two kilograms of samples from the far side, the hemisphere that never faces Earth. The central question is whether these tiny grains support a shared volcanic history between both sides of the moon, or reveal something unique. We will look at early, peer-reviewed results where available, alongside working hypotheses still being tested. And there is another question worth asking. Why did it take more than half a century of lunar exploration before anyone could bring back even a single far-side rock? For most of the space age, all the lunar rock samples in laboratories came from one hemisphere only. Apollo missions from 1969 to 1972 and the Soviet lunar missions from 1970 to 1976 returned precious material, but all from the near side, the half of the moon that always faces Earth. This created a major imbalance. One side studied in depth, the other left without a single anchor point for laboratory analysis. The difference is not that the far side is another world, but that the moon is tidally locked. That means it rotates once on its axis in the same time it takes to orbit Earth. One face stays visible, and the opposite face never does. For engineers in the Apollo and lunar era, this made operations far more practical on the near side. Landers there could communicate directly with Earth. On the far side, line of sight communications were impossible, and no relay satellites existed to bridge the gap. Return flight plans stayed deliberately simple, and mission designers focused only on reachable targets. That left scientists dependent on indirect tools for far side geology. Crater count chronology was one of the main methods. In plain terms, it estimates the age of a surface by counting impact craters. Older terrain accumulates more scars than younger lava plains. On the near side, this method was calibrated because Apollo and Luna brought back rocks that could be directly dated. On the far side, no such ground truth existed. Ages had to be guessed relative to near side events, without a physical sample to confirm the timeline. The result was a patchwork of valuable, but uncertain estimates. Remote sensing did reveal that the two hemispheres look strikingly different. The near side is dominated by broad volcanic plains called Maria, where ancient lava flows spread across impact basins. The far side has a much thicker crust and far fewer Maria. That raised core questions. Did the far side cool faster and shut down volcanism earlier? Or did the asymmetry reflect differences in impact history, mantle heat, or chemical composition? Without rock samples, scientists could only frame hypotheses. There was no way to confirm whether far side events matched the volcanic timeline established on the near side. Progress came in 2020 with China's Chang'e 5 mission. It returned samples from a younger volcanic plane, providing fresh near side data beyond the Apollo sites. But the gap remained. Chang'e 5 gave no information from the far side, and the central question lingered. Did the far side evolve on the same schedule as the near side? or along a different path. That is what elevated Chang'e 6 to historic significance. The probe launched on the 3rd of May 2024, landed on the 2nd of June in Apollo Basin, inside the giant South Pole Aitken Basin, and delivered nearly two kilograms of soil back to Inner Mongolia on 25th June. These facts provide a mission timeline, not an interpretation, but they mark the first time that physical far side samples were transported to Earth. The collection site sits in one of the largest and oldest impact structures on the Moon, a place considered central to establishing the chronology of early lunar history. Chang'e 6 turned decades of indirect reasoning into direct data. Understanding why it took until 2024 highlights how dependent exploration is on the intersection of technology, operations and science. Relay communications, autonomous sampling systems and return logistics all had to mature before far-side sampling became feasible. With these elements aligned, 
scientists can now test competing hypotheses about heat flow, crust thickness, and volcanic activity with actual material evidence rather than remote inferences. For the first time, the hidden hemisphere now speaks with a physical record in laboratories on Earth. But bringing it back required more than a lander and scoop. It meant assembling a toolkit that could work where Earth has no line of sight. How that toolkit functioned in practice comes next. Reaching the far side was only possible with a carefully designed suite of hardware that worked together as one system. The most critical element was communications. Because Earth never faces that hemisphere directly, Chang'e 6 required a dedicated relay satellite. Kuekiao 2 provided the relay link, keeping line of sight between the lander on the far side and ground controllers. It acted as the middle step in every signal path, turning silence into a real-time exchange of commands and telemetry. The spacecraft itself had four coordinated elements, an orbiter circling the moon, a lander that touched down in Apollo Basin, an ascender that lifted the sealed container into lunar orbit, and a returner that carried the samples home. This architecture mirrored earlier Chang'e missions, but with added complexity due to the far side location and the need for relay communications. Each piece had a defined role, and together they enabled the delivery of nearly two kilograms of lunar material back to Earth. Operations on the surface were constrained by time. The lander had about 14 hours to drill, scoop, and package samples. That short window came from limits in power and thermal control, as well as orbital timing. With no ability for Earth-based teams to make constant real-time corrections, the lander executed most steps through semi-autonomous control. It recognized safe terrain, adjusted its sampling sequence, and finalized soil storage without continuous input. The outcome showed that far-side landings can be managed with this degree of autonomy, a model for missions where human controllers cannot intervene directly. Beyond engineering, Chang'e 6 hosted scientific payloads from international partners. The European Space Agency's instrument called NILS, or negative ions at the lunar surface, was the first negative ion detector to operate on the lunar surface. The team confirmed more than three hours of usable data, roughly three times the baseline requirement. NILS directly recorded negative ions formed when particles from the solar wind struck the surface. Earlier studies could only infer their presence. These in situ measurements ground theories about how charged particles interact with lunar soil. How these processes influence long term dust motion or chemistry remains under study. Italy's INRRI, a passive laser retro reflector, added another capability. A retro reflector bounces a light beam straight back to its sender. Unlike active sensors, INRRI operates without power and is designed to withstand lunar surface conditions long into the future. Scientists can aim laser pulses at it from orbit, obtaining precise distance measurements. Its installation on the far side establishes a permanent ranging control point, improving navigation for future orbiters and surface craft. Other contributions included a French-built radon detector to monitor gas release from lunar rocks and a small Pakistani orbiter camera that added imaging support. Their presence broadened the mission's scope, extending environmental measurements beyond soil return. Support also extended beyond the surface. ESA ground stations in multiple regions tracked Chang'e 6 during launch, orbital maneuvers, and final re-entry over Inner Mongolia. These services confirmed spacecraft health and sample capsule recovery, showing that lunar exploration is increasingly a shared endeavor even when a single nation leads the mission. Altogether, this toolkit showed how far-side operations depend on more than landing technique. They require orbital relays, autonomous controls, and international instruments that can function within narrow timelines. The result was a layered achievement, material from a place never sampled before, paired with new physical measurements on the surface itself. With the systems explained, attention shifts to the purpose behind them. What do the returned grains reveal about the moon's history? The mainstream early conclusion is that the far side samples contain glassy impact melt, crustal fragments, and basaltic pieces. These components are consistent with known volcanic processes on the Moon and point to a shared deep interior history between both hemispheres. In short, the materials resemble what has been measured from the near side, suggesting a common origin beneath the crust rather than two fundamentally different moons. Chang'e 6 returned about 1.94 kilograms of material from Apollo Basin inside the South Pole Aitken Basin. 
The choice of Apollo Basin matters because it sits within the largest and oldest impact structure on the Moon. South Pole Aitken stretches roughly 2,500 kilometers across, deep enough to expose material from far below the lunar surface. By bringing sealed samples from this site, the mission gives scientists a chance to date one of the Moon's earliest events directly, not just by surface counts. Early 2025 laboratory analyses argue that the South Pole Aitken impact occurred at roughly 4.25 billion years ago. If upheld by further studies, that age becomes a major anchor for crater count chronology. Crater counting estimates relative ages by tallying impact scars across different surfaces. The method only works well if at least one region has a known laboratory age as a reference. With a firm candidate age for South Pole Aitken, scientists can recalibrate other parts of the Moon and, by extension, infer impact histories for Earth, Mars and the inner solar system with greater accuracy. In terms of composition, scientists report grains of impact melt glass formed in high temperature collisions, fragments of ancient crust broken apart multiple times, and pieces of basalt. Basalt forms when lava erupts and solidifies quickly at the surface. Finding basalt among the grains shows that volcanic activity affected the far side as well, and that the chemistry of those rocks traces back to the same mantle reservoirs feeding eruptions on the near side. The consensus view is that both hemispheres draw from one deep reservoir. The main difference is not their source, but the relative timing and surface expression of volcanism. Two working hypotheses remain active. The first is the Crypto-Maria hypothesis. Buried volcanic plains may underlie parts of the far side, hidden over time by impacts and ejecta. If traces of these Crypto-Maria are present in the Apollo Basin samples, volcanism was more widespread than current images show. The second is the Deep Mantle Ejecta hypothesis. The South Pole Aitken impact was so powerful that it could have thrown up material from deep inside the moon. If some fragments in the regolith come from this layer, the samples may represent mantle composition, which is rarely probed directly. Distinguishing which hypothesis better explains the basalt fragments matters because it changes the story. One possibility records surface volcanic flows. The other preserves signatures of the deep interior. What does this mean? Even with open questions, the primary accomplishment is clear. For the first time, the age of the largest lunar basin is pinned down by direct laboratory measurement. The mineral and chemical evidence supports the idea of a shared, global lunar interior. At the same time, the grains carry clues that anchor new debates. Was volcanism hidden more extensively than we thought? Or are we holding pieces of the Moon's mantle? Both answers matter for future exploration. If Crypto Maria are proven, far-side volcanic history lasted longer and may have influenced crust thickness in ways models still underestimate. If mantle ejecta are confirmed, these samples could be humanity's first direct look at a planetary interior beyond Earth. Either conclusion marks a step change in planetary science, and both show why Chang'e 6 will be studied for decades. Refined age measurements and chemical studies from these grains will guide where Chang'e 7 and other international missions target next. By converting educated guesses into hard numbers, the far side samples set the stage for more precise landing choices and deeper tests of lunar chronology. They carry consequences not just for one hemisphere, but for how we time early events across the solar system. The far side soil is no longer silent. It is now part of the measured clock of planetary history. Key takeaway, far side samples convert long-standing inference into measurement and place the moon's earliest chapter on a firmer clock. Landing in Apollo Basin, returning 1.94 kilograms of soil, lab dating near 4.25 billion years, and new surface measurements together make this a step change. For clear updates on lunar chronology and what Chang'e 7 and Artemis will test next, subscribe and stay with us. Coming up soon, we explore how a new anchor age reshapes crater dating across the inner solar system.